So essentially what you're looking at on the screen now is uh, a PCB. It's called the Scan Plus Demo Board. And the Scan Plus Demo Board is a board that Corellis has developed um, as a, uh, a test bed for our entry-level customers. So it essentially provides different um, devices, components, um, and other things so that you can get a good feel and understanding of how boundary scan works on a on a on a target PCB. So we have a AMCC power PC processor, we got some memory devices, we got some CPLDs and some FPGAs on here, some flash devices, LEDs, and some fault switches down at the bottom so you can actually flip them and inject failures into this board to see how our software responds to them. Oh, okay. So Basically, the demonstration I'm going to give to you is uh, focused on this board. Now, our tool set, our, our family of tool set is called Scan Express. Now, there are very uh, several different modules available in the Scan Express suite. Uh, there's four modules which we're going to talk about today. There's the TPG, which is the test pattern generator. There's the runner, which is the execution station. There's the DFT, which tells you how much testability you're going to get when using our test procedures. And finally, the viewer, which you're actually looking at now, which is a graphical interface for helping to locate where faults are on a PCB. Okay. So the first thing... So, okay, okay, let me interrupt a little bit. Sure. Okay, you have all the chips there. So basically, it tests the interconnect of all, all, all those devices, right? That's correct. The um, so the PowerPC chip, the Lattice chip, the yeah. uh, Xilinx chips here, um, and the Altera chips, they all have boundary scans. So we've connected them in a scan chain on this board so that we can inject test patterns throughout the scan chain. Okay. And therefore, yes, we can test interconnectivity between those devices. Okay. Now, at, now at the same time, there's other non-JTAG devices on here, like the memory devices and the flash devices. Now, those devices are connected up to the JTAG pins, and thus we can stimulate those non-JTAG devices with the boundary scan pins, and thus creating the capability to like read and write from memory devices, or program flash, or turn on and off an LED so that you can visually see what's going on. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to go through here is the uh, the Scan Express TBG software, which is the test pattern generation tool. This is a tool you use to actually create the test vectors, um, the test procedure for your for your board. So the first thing we do is give it a project name. I'm just going to call it ASE, um, and then project directory. This is the project directory is where you locate all your uh, files. Now initially, when you start a project you're going to have to get the BSDL files for the parts that you're working with. Um, you might have to get the uh, memory models if you want to test memory devices, schematics, bill of materials, stuff like that. Okay. So I've already put a lot of these files in this directory, the ScanPlus demo board directory. So I'm going to click the next button and then you'll see a test flow on this left side of the screen. The green um, button represents where we currently are at. Um, and the uh, the rest of the buttons is base just a basic flow for actually inputting the information into the test pattern generation tool. The first piece of information that we need is a net list. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the net list, um, and I, I get a dialog box telling me, okay, uh, I need the scan plus demo board. So I'm going to I'm going to select the scan plus db net. Then uh, I'm going to do the same thing for the bill materials. Now the bill materials is an optional piece. You don't necessarily need it, but when you do have it, it gives you extra information uh, to to reduce visibility and make things more clear as to what you're looking at. So the there are three pieces of information that you need. There's the part number part description and the reference designators. So I'm just going to select the columns for each of those, part number, part description, and the reference designator. And you can see the colors change for when each of the columns are selected. 
Now then there's a uh, schematic involved. Again, this is another optional piece. You don't have to have it. Um, but when you do, um, it's very useful for finding um, reference designators, pin numbers, uh, net names, stuff of that sort. Once we provide all this information, uh, we've pretty much given all the required inputs to the ScanExpress tools for test vector generation. So then we click the next button and it does a little bit of processing on the net list and the bill of materials. Make sure that they're in good formats and they're readable we can understand them. And from there then we go down the next sequence in the buttons. So now we go to the power and grounds um, button here. Power and grounds is where we identify to the tool which of the nets are power nets and which of the nets are ground nets. Now there's an auto find button that allows us to do this automatically and uh, we can see that when I click that auto find button there were certain nets that were automatically tagged as being either a ground or a power net. The, uh, the information comes from the automation configuration screen which is located in the tools menu. So if I click the automation configuration screen um, it comes up with a naming convention tab and up at the top there's two search strings available for the ground nets and the power nets. Now there's uh, criteria for exact name searches and there's criteria for text contained within searches. So um, depending on how you modify this um, set of data depends on how uh, our tool will tag certain nets as being power ground. And this data is all customizable by the user so you can change it to whatever nomenclature your particular board has. Um, this what what came up right now is just the default data that comes with the with the system. Now you can um, sort any of these columns by just clicking them. So you can sort by the net name, you can sort by the pins per net, or you can sort on what nets are tagged as power and ground. So you can see there's a couple other nets that are also tagged as power nets um, that didn't show up on the screen previously because they were located down further um, in the net list. So once we've identified our power and grounds, now we can tell the tool what are the resistors. Um, because there's going to be pull-up resistors, there's going to be pull-down resistors, and there's going to be series resistors. Um, so essentially all I need to do is tell the tool what particular components are my resistors. And, and typically most um, reference designators today use the nomenclature R followed by a number. So R1, R2, etc. These are all your resistor components. So if I do an auto find here, It'll ask me for a, a, a model library. Uh, TBG has a built-in model library, which will, you'll probably use for the majority of your projects. But in case you wanted to use your own custom library, you could. For this demonstration, I'm just going to use the basic default library. And you can see once I do that, the model column is filled in for all the resistors. And then it tells me that these are resistor components along with what type of resistor they are, whether it be a pull-up, pull-down, or series. Um, and it knows they're pull-ups and pull-downs because we gave it the information previously on what nets were power nets and what nets were ground nets. So I scroll down, I can see um, all the resistors that are tagged. There's actually one here that's not installed, that's marked as not installed. That is because this device was found in the net list, but it was not found in the bill of materials. So if you have a post-assembly bill of materials, any devices that don't show up in that bomb will be automatically assumed to be not installed on the board and therefore ignored for the test procedure process. So it makes entry of, uh, of that data a lot cleaner and easier. Now down at the bottom we have resistor network components. So these aren't your standard two pin type resistors. These are actually network, um, can be isolated networks, it can be bus networks. Um, based on the descriptions you can see that they're bus type uh, 4.7K, they have a specific part number. So we can kind of infer what kind of uh, part that is. But let's say for instance we didn't know what type of device this is. 
we can right click on any one of these components and use the view schematic option and that will launch our PDF viewer and do a, a search for that reference designator and it takes us right to it because it automatically creates a search macro for us. So if I zoom into that part we can see this is RM1 and it's a 16 pin bus type resistor. Pin 16 is my common which goes to my VCC and the other 15 pins are my pull up resistors. So based on that knowledge I can go back to TBG and I can select an appropriate model for that device. So I click the re resistor network button and then I look for the appropriate um, model for that guy. So we know it's 16 pins, we know it's a bus type resistor network. So this is the closest match. Now if I want to dive in further I can always use the view button to view what the pinout is for that particular part. So in this case we see pin 16 is our common and the other 15 pins are the pull-ups. So this is an appropriate model for this guy. So I select him and we can see that the model is now assigned here and it tells us it's a pull-up which matches what we saw in the schematic. Now there's several parts on this board that are the same part number. So this 416P-T-02-472 shows up four times down here. So I can select the same model for all these part numbers by just right clicking saying select the resistor network for all these part numbers and then select the appropriate model and we can see it fills in all that data automatically for all the other devices. So that's very convenient when you have a bill of materials, some of the extra capabilities that you get. Um, and then there's one last resistor network here, which is a different part number, RN3. Um, it is the same type of part number, but just to make sure, I'm going to use that view schematic feature again. Right click, it's going to do a search macro. It's going to find RN3, it found RN3 and we can see this one's actually a pull down as opposed to a pull up but it's the same type of resistor pack. It's a 16 pin bust resistor pack. So I go back here, select my resistor network button and then apply that model. We can see he's been tagged as a pull down as opposed to a pull up just based on how it's implemented in the schematic. So now I've tagged all my resistors so now I'm basically done with this screen and I can move on to the next screen. So the next screen is what we call transparencies. Transparencies um, are like series resistors, jumpers, uh, buffers that are enabled that you basically pass through information from the inputs to the outputs, um, FETs that can be turned on, stuff of that nature. Now this particular um, board has a bunch of series resistors and these series resistors have already been automatically transparented by the tool. So we recognize that series resistors are a transparent to device and the, the user doesn't have to do any work on his part to identify those. Now there is one component in this board that can be made a transparent device and that's the, uh, the 244 buffer. Now if I right click on that buffer and use the view schematic tool it'll come up with my uh, search window here and it'll show me okay there's this buffer 244 it's got eight inputs eight outputs and two output enable pins so when this when this buffer is enabled meaning my output enable pins are activated by sending a low there um, my outputs follow my inputs so that that's what we consider a transparent device now knowing that information I can go back to TBG and select an appropriate model for him. So um, I use the select model button and this is the default library I was talking about earlier. Um, I'm going to go down and select the most appropriate model for this guy. It's a buffer 244 and, I, and again if I'm not familiar with these models I can always view what pinout they are. So I, I push the view button and it tells me the model name tells me whether or not the model is a directional um, model um, and it tells me what the input pins are and the output pins are if it's a directional model, model or if it's a bi-directional device it'll just say the pin numbers or the pin yeah the pin numbers down at the bottom it shows you pins to fix low so it says 
fix I want to fix low pins 1 and 19 to keep this buffer enabled in order to make sure it's transparent at all times. So if I select that model, um, it says 240 now buffer 244 is applied or tagged to with this specific reference designator. So now this this device is now considered to be a transparency and will be tested accordingly when we generate the vectors. The rest of the devices in this list are not, not transparent devices, so they can be ignored from this screen. Um, a lot of these other devices are BSDL files or, or, or JTAG devices, memory devices, flash devices, which we'll assign a different model later on. So I click the next and I go one step down to the BSDL files section. Now here we have a blank screen because we haven't identified any JTAG devices. Now I've already put all the BSDL files for this project into that directory I, I assigned earlier. So I'm just going to add and then it, it lists all the BSDL files in my directory on the right here and it shows me all the JTAG devices on the left. Um, so essentially what I have to do is assign uh, which BSDL file goes which which JTAG device. So you can either drag and drop or you can do it automatically using the auto find. So if I click the auto find it'll automatically associate the BSDL files based on the file name and the part number of the device. If they closely match then it will automatically assign a BSDL file to that device. Once everything is assigned here, if we close that screen, we can see that now I have a scan chain that is created based on the BSDL files that I've identified to each reference designator. Okay, so um, I have U3 would be considered the first device in the scan chain, U5 would be considered the last device in the scan chain. If you needed to reorder things here, you can drag and drop things around. You can even add a tap break. So if you wanted to identify it as two separate scan chains, you could. We do have hardware that supports uh, multiple scan chains so that you can actually tie them together externally. Um, if you want the tool to figure out what the scan chain is, we also have an arrange feature. So down at the bottom, there's an arrange button. I click that. It'll process the netlist. It'll process the BSDL files. And um, it will determine what the correct scan chain order is on its own. So you can see after I did that, it reordered everything uh, as opposed to how I had it earlier. So it told, it told me that U1 is the first device in the scan chain and U5 is my last device in the scan chain. And this is the correct order of the, uh, this particular target. I can even show you if I, if I go into the schematic and I show you page 1, uh, which basically breaks down the scan chain, um, this is a block diagram of what our JTAG scan chain looks like. So U1 is the first device, U5 is the last device, and it just continues on from there. So what the tool found and what the board is are, are both matched and they're correct. So now I've identified all my boundary scan parts. The next section is to move down to the memories and clusters. So the memories and clusters are where, where we identify memory devices like SS RAMs, SD RAMs, flash devices, um, dual port memories, stuff of that nature. And we can also identify um, non-boundary scan parts that we want to make sure that they're disabled so that they don't interfere with the test vectors that we generate. So the first thing I'm going to do is specify a model for my memories. So I have um, one SS RAM on this board and two SD RAMs. So I'm going to select a model for the first one, which is the SS RAM, highlight it, select the memory, and then there's these uh, MIF models that I've already placed in my project directory, which basically identify the pinout for each memory, how to read from that memory, how to write to that memory, how to turn it off when it's not being used, um, and so on and so forth. So when I select that memory, it comes up as part of the, uh, as, as tagged for this particular reference designator. I can double click this, um, this MIF file and it brings it up in a text editor so I can actually 
uh, read their read the contents of that of this file and examine to see what it, what it is exactly. And you can basically see it just identifies the address bus pin numbers. It identifies the data bus pin numbers, control bus pin numbers, how to read from the memory, how to write from the memory, how to turn the memory off after the test is completed, and how to turn the memory off when it's not being tested uh, during other tests like the interconnect tests or non-memory related tests. So um, I can do the same thing for the other two devices. I have two SD RAMs which they match um, as far as the part number is concerned. So I can select an appropriate MIF file for those devices as well. As well. And, the, and just for your information, it, these are Corellis files. These are Corellis provided files. We actually have a directory assigned with the installation of our software that has um, roughly a hundred of these MIF files that we've accumulated over the years um, to, for testing different memory devices. So I'm going to go ahead and select those two um, and we can see the models now applied for those devices. Now there's two um, there's two more devices here which are not memory devices but they're flashes so they actually the flash library is slightly different from the memory library and that's why we have different buttons to assign models for each device now the flash device so I highlight the one I want to tag use the select flash button and it will come up with the closest match based on the part number that was assigned to it earlier and this comes from the bill materials now, if I didn't have a bill of materials, the user, uh, in this case myself, would have to go through our extensive library of flash devices and choose the select manufacturer, um, and then choose the select correct part number for the manufacturer device that I'm using, and then select the appropriate package for the particular device that I'm working with. So um, there's a lot of information that you have available to you. You can also select different options if you wanted to program the flash or if you just wanted to read the device ID all these options are available to you in, in different sections so you, we have uh, the ability to erase or not erase the part or partially erase the part um, little endian stuff like that so I'm going to go ahead and quickly select the uh, flash device for the second memory or second flash device that we have this is an Intel flash and again the tool based on the part number that's assigned in the bill of materials comes up with the closest match in the uh, in the flash library so I just say OK and then the last part here is neither a memory nor a flash but it's a crystal oscillator and if I right click I can use that view schematic feature again so um, I go ahead and search for my U14 part and zoom in here we can see it's just a four pin crystal oscillator uh, the clock pin is the uh, pin 3 output and there's an output enable pin to turn this guy off uh, but we can see here that it's uh, pulled high so this clock can never be disabled so that's kind of important for the tool to know that this clock can never be disabled so we can assign what's called the CIF file or cluster information file um, by uh, highlighting the device and using the disable cluster button and then um, I've already placed a SIF file in my directory and again we have a library of these devices as well or these files as well so I'm going to go ahead and select that one and I can double click him and show you what the contents are this file is very easy it's basically telling me that pin 1 is the pin that will disable pin 3 when it's low um, and then pin 3 is my output so that, that's essentially the only information now how the tool uses this files it says okay I'm gonna see if I can control pin 1 if I can drive it low I know I can disable my clock um, and that's a good thing that means I, I can test the clock um, from a boundary scan point of view if I can't disable this clock pin I know that the, the clock is likely to be always driving and I don't want to drive a test pattern against that clock. 
So that's essentially what these models, um, what information the model gives to the tool. So I've selected all the models for the, the remaining parts here. I can move on to the next screen, which is uh, constraints. Um, basically, there's different levels of test coverage here, partial, moderate, complete, extensive. Um, partial is the least amount of test coverage, um, all the way up to extensive, which essentially tests everything possible using boundary scan. And then there's constraints, which if you want to fix certain things high or fix certain things low, uh, you have the abil ability to do that. If you click the Add button, you'll see different constraint types, fixing things, fixing nets or pins high, fixing pins low during the test, sensing them high, toggling them. You can also manipulate the net list by merging nets together, removing pins, removing um, nets, renaming nets, so on and so forth. For this particular board, um, there's not a whole lot of constraints that I need to add because most everything is taken care of automatically. So I'm going to go to the finish screen, which is the last screen, and it's going to give me a list of all the test steps that will be generated. Um, Um, so basically we can see that the infrastructure test, um, which is a scan chain sanity check, there's a interconnect test which tests the interconnectivity, um, also the bus wire test tests the interconnectivity, um, there's a pull up pull down test to do the resistors, memory test for all the memories that we identified and flash test for the flash parts that we identified. So when I click finish, we go from the preparation step to the generation step and uh, here's a list of all the test steps that were created now I need to compile those to generate the test factors so I click this generate all button and it just compiles them one at a time and if it's a successful compile you'll see a green dot if it's not a successful compile you would see a red dot and the log would give you an error message indicating where what the error was what the line number was so on and so forth so essentially I now have created a test procedure for that board that I showed you earlier. What I'm going to do now is show you the ScanExpress DFT tool um, which tells us what the level of test coverage is. So I've, I click this report uh, icon here and basically it launched my ScanExpress DFT analyzer and we can see there's report files that were imported from the TBG tool and it's going to, this, this DFT analyzer tool is going to process those reports and tell me how much testability I'm going to get. So I click the generate button, it processes those report files and uh, on the right here I now see statistical information in regards to the board. So I have um, a total number of nets, total number of 349 nets. Of those nets there's 313 nets that have scannable pins on it. That means it has a boundary scannable control controlled pin. And then it breaks down what's tested. Well there's 320 nets that are fully tested. There's 11 nets that are partially tested. Um, so the total number of tested nets is 331 or about 95 percent of this board. You can also view detailed information on the tool. So what I did is uh, launch a view reports button here and there's different reports available to show you this one for example shows you compliance enable pins now a compliance enable pin is a specific pin on a boundary scan device that must be held at a certain level in order for that device to remain boundary scan compliant usually if it's driven in the in in the opposite direction that part um, internal tap controller will go into the reset state and therefore you, you won't be able to ship data through that part. Um, now by default our tools will automatically constrain uh, compliance enable pins to the correct level um, but we'll do an analysis for you to make sure that your design uh, ensures that these compliance pins are in the compliant state meaning there's a pull-up resistor when it needs to be high or a pull-down resistor when it needs to be low. 
Now there's other parts or there's other reports like here's one that does a pin uh, per device coverage report. So it lists all of the reference designators, tells you how many total pins there are on each device, uh, tells you how many of those pins are completely tested, how many of those pins are partially tested, and then uh, takes the combination of those two, divides it by the number of pins, and tells you basically the overall statistical testability of that part. And then there's just a bunch of other reports. Um, I'm not going to go through them each one, but there's some reports that will tell you what's being tested, the level of coverage that you're getting, whether it's fully tested or partially tested. Fully tested typically means you're testing for both opens and shorts on any given pin or any given net. And partially tested can mean a wide variety of things, like a net's being fixed at a specific level, so it can only be checked for stuck-at conditions at the opposite state or it might be being tested for shorts only, um, things of that nature. Um, and then the summary reports again just showing you what, uh, what the overall percentage coverage is for all the nets and all the pins of the board. So in a nutshell that's basically what the DFT analyzer does. Um, from here I'm going to launch the runner tool and um, basically the runner tool, like I said earlier, is the execution tool. And, and essentially what happened is when I launched it, it automatically created the test plan for me. So all of my test steps are listed on my screen. Um, and I need to make sure that my controller is set up correctly. So the controller is the hardware piece in between your target board and the PC. So you'll have it you know we have USB controllers, we have PCI controllers, PCMCIA controllers, uh, Ethernet controllers, so on down the list. Um, so in this case I'm using a, a net USB box uh, with the USB interface. I have my T clock frequency set to 10 megahertz um, so everything looks good there and then I need to make sure my board's powered on and it is so I'm going to go ahead and just run this test ask me if I want to overwrite or append to the log file. I'm just going to overwrite it. And we can see it very quickly passes through the list of tests that we generated. So I did an infrastructure test, the interconnect, the bus wire, the resistor test, the memories, and the flash tests. Um, and a total execution time is down here at uh, two and a half seconds. Now you know it's great to see everything pass but you know you want to understand how our tools uh, provide you the information or, or indicate the information to you when a board fails so what I'm going to do is flip one of those switches on the board um, and show you how it fails okay. so I flipped a, a switch S6 now before I actually run the test I'm going to go into the schematic and do a search for S6 so that we can get an idea of what we expect the failure to be. So S6 is a normally open switch so when I when I flip it it closes this and creates a short. That short happens between um, this net SDRAM data 2 and SDRAM data 3. So if I run the test it should show me a fault in that area. So we can see it did fail now I need to look at that failure and basically it says okay I found an interconnect test fault it's a bridging fault and it was detected between these two nets SDRAM data 2 SD data, data 3 it tells me where the most likely areas of this short occurs and then also what devices are on those nets uh, whether they be boundary scan pins or non boundary scan pins you can also look at the test vectors that uh, were executed. So this is a list of all the test vectors that were executed. And you know we can just scroll down and see um, a huge number of them. You can also filter it down to if you only want to see the failed nets. Uh, you can filter down even further if you only want to see the failed pins. Um, you can also 
identify the vectors in a graphical format. So if you're more comfortable looking at waveforms as opposed to ones and zeros, that feature is also available to you. So that's a bridging fault. Um, what I'll do is also inject a, another fault for an open. And again, what I've done is I'm going to do a search for uh, S8. Okay, so S8 is down here. Now this is a normally closed switch. So when I, op when I uh, flip the switch, it opens this circuit. And I can see that this, this goes to pin 20 on my Xilinx CPLD, which is reference designator U5. So when I run the test, it should show me that U5 pin 20 has been opened. So I ran it again, and it failed. I double click that failure and I can see okay my interconnect test failed again fault detected on net data bus 2 receiver u5 pin 20 is open or stuck so that's that's pretty much the uh, advanced diagnostics capability now you can also from here launch the viewer application so So I launched the viewer, and it basically imported the uh, the results from the from the most recent um, error. The fa the fault uh, window down here imported the fault from runner. So I can basically click on U5 pin 20, and it will basically show me exactly where that pin is located. You can then zoom in. If you want to get a better indication of where it's at, um, you can zoom in even further, and, and it basically we can use our tool tips, and it'll, it'll tell me exactly what pin that is, U5 pin 20, this is 21, 22, so on and so forth. So the nice thing about this viewer is it, it gives you a basic overview of your, your board, allows you to locate faults. Um, you can do things for both sides of the board. For example, um, I can I can turn the other side of the board on. So if I want to look at the back side, we, we support double-sided images. Um, you can also use this for finding components. Say you wanted to find a specific resistor on your board, you didn't have a silk screen, or you have thousands of resistors on your product and you don't know where a specific one is at, you can basically use the devices screen to find R21 and that that'll take you essentially right to it. R2122, R121, R119 up here, so on and so forth. So it's a pretty useful tool for uh, maneuvering around your product. So that's essentially um, you know our tool set in a nutshell. Um, it's basically the uh, the two piece two major pieces are the test vector generation and the test vector execution. And then you have pieces add-on pieces to each of those. You have the DFT, which is kind of an add-on to the TBG that gives you the statistical information, and then the viewer, which is an add-on to the execution station that gives you more visibility on where the error is located. So do you have any questions so far? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, your, your demo is very clear, and uh, I think right now I understand what uh, I mean, what your product is doing. Okay. What it's doing. Is this basically okay? If I tr if I trying to trying to uh, j okay trying to j just say that you okay if I understand correctly, basically your software actually tests all those inter interconnects of the PCB board, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. See. Um, uh, what what I need is uh, this, like say uh, for example, you on a board you have a, a lattice, you have a Xilinx uh, FPGA, right? Yes. Let's say I want to just test that one part, F, uh, the Xilinx part, and uh, you know of course for the Xilinx part there's a JTAG access pin, right? Yep. So I can design a simple board 
uh, do I need to power, power up a device? Let, let's say right now, I just want, I just want to test that one device myself. On okay. Board. Yes, you can do that. Do I, do I need to power up the the uh, the, the I mean the the part? Like a, a connect the VDD and the VSSS. Yes. The part. You do. You J do, right? JTAG requires power to be applied. Yes. Oh, okay. I need to power. I need to power up a device, right? That's correct. Then I just use this uh, JTAG pins access to this uh, device itself. Correct. And I can find out the internal connections. Is that, is that exactly? Is that what you two can can, can do? Uh, not not so much the internal connections, but you're you're testing the boundary scan cell um, capability to whatever else it's connected to. So um, on a on a most on a simplistic scale, if you only have a single de single device, your Xilinx device, yeah, um, you you basically can manipulate a pin, and then take a scope or a meter and measure that pin to make sure it's wiggling high or low depending on whatever you set it to. Okay. Okay. See that um. so to test for opens. You need uh, you need at least two devices, one to drive a vector and one to receive that vector. If you don't have two devices, then you have to use some other external equipment to take that measurement for you. Okay. Okay. But but for shorts testing, um, one device is fine because we we drive all the patterns out simultaneously and all the pins and read them back at the same time. So if if two pins were shorted, we would be able to detect that with only a single boundary scan device. Okay. So Robert, are you mainly looking to detect shorts or shorts and opens or just opens? Uh, I think uh, basically uh, shorts and opens, right? Uh, because like say, uh, right now, I, I, uh, I mean a customer is you know, trying to ask me to test a, 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 a FPGA part. And so they're telling me, okay, did this part fail? Uh, now, do you pull that part off the board and then you test the chip? Uh, yeah, that that part will be pulled will be pulled out from the board. Hmm. Uh, well, well, one of the things that JTAG allows you to do is perform this type of testing, opens and shorts, uh -huh. without actually removing the IC. Oh, okay. So that that's 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 the whole thing that JTAG offers. So you don't you don't have you don't have to question on whether or not that part is good. You can do a test on the product while it's still soldered to the board, and we can detect if there's any opens or shorts on on those pins. And then after you make that determination, then you can take the part off and replace it. Okay. Now these boards, uh, Robert, are they JTAG compliant? Do they have the JTAG yeah, see, interface uh, part? Uh, I mean that part I don't know. See, the, the, the thing I know is uh, you know uh, what what we got from customers. Like they they have a they have a bunch of parts. Yeah, the, the Xilinx many. parts will definitely be uh, the parts fail on a system. So of course you know once they fail on a the system, then they you know they have they have their, their own tool too, right? So to find out, oh okay, because this uh, Xilinx part doesn't work. So it sounds like you're using this method for repair. Is that correct? Uh, are you repairing these boards, or are you just validating to whether or not the chip is um, operational or not? Uh, well, see, in, in order to to validate if the parts complete function or not, that's 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 a difficult task, right? Uh -huh. That that need a, 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 a all you know, you know, vectors, all all kinds of vectors uh -huh. from the you know from the from the from the vendor, right? You know, like a, how how they program it, and then use those vector pattern to test the device. Okay, uh, but right now it's like well, I mean, what what I'm thinking is most likely since the part was working before, right? They, you know, when the, when the parts out of the door, this those manufacturers they must test it already, right? Then when this part started on the, on on the, on a the board, when something fail, uh, I, I the first thing I you know I, I you know I'm thinking. I'm thinking about is uh, the interconnect uh, problem. Mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, maybe there's an open short. Right, right between now. either that device and uh, uh, driving device and a receiving device. So, so. Uh, and also, if I understand correctly, the JTAG actually actually can t can test internal, right? I mean, can go into a device to test those logical blocks, right? The, the interconnect between you know, the logical blocks. No. Right? Yeah. No. Not not the logic blocks. It tests. Uh, it tests inside the device, but it tests the boundary scan chain. 
okay. which is which is isolated from the internal logic. Uh -huh. So it's you're you're testing from the boundary scan chain to the external pins. Okay. Um, so the internal logic has no effect on whether a pin is soldered to a board or not. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So essentially, we we can we can tell if there's an open or a short on a specific pin without dealing with the internal logic. That that's how the JTAG technology works, and that's how it's built inside each IC. Okay. I see. Okay. Are you um, looking to test the internal logic of the chip? Or are you looking well, to? Well, he he can't test the internal logic if he's if he's no, removing devices from the board. Tech. No, if he's removing the device from the board, he doesn't have power, so there is no internal logic. Yeah. Okay. Once the part, okay. Once the part got removed from from the from the board, you know, I can I still can you know use uh, you know use the um, I, I think I'm powered up. Uh, I, I think I'm powered up, right? Yes, you can power it up, but um, I can power it up, and also I can use uh, you know uh, probes to access this uh, uh, JTAG portion, right? Sure. Yes, but what I'm saying is the internal logic is is loaded up during each power up of a Xilinx FPGA, so uh -huh. it's not something that's uh, fixed inside the chip. Once you once you power it down, that memory is gone. Yeah, yeah. And so you oh, right, yeah, you cannot yeah, the JTAG cannot cannot test the you know the the, log, the the functionality of the device. Exactly. That's what I'm but, saying. But you can test the you know the internal the, the internal portion actually. Uh, internal is actually is pretty complicated, right? There's so many there's so many uh, logic blocks, right? And, I mean that, that 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 that's what JTAG is for, right? I mean you, you go through the, the 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 you know some kind of a some kind of a, a flip flop. To, to to check if there's a interconnect problem, right? No, that's uh, that's not what JTAG tackles. Oh, J JTAG okay. is tackling the external pins, okay, not the internal flip flops. So, okay, so can can you use that five pin to find out if if uh, if, uh, if other pins, uh, my external pins got shorted or open? Yes. You can. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, well. I think I think that's what I need. If if that's if if uh that that's what it that's what it sounds like to me is what you need as well. I mean, from from your point of view, you know, it's it's very difficult to test the internal to internals of a part um, because like a manufacturer like Xilinx, you know, that's that's their IP, um, that's their technology, so they're not going to release that. IP to just anybody uh, for testing their product, but yeah, yeah, but right. the but the external pin and the JTAG uh, interface is publicly available. It's public domain, so anybody can generate test vectors for a JTAG vector and utilize that portion of their device. And that's essentially what JTAG was designed for to give uh -huh. a generic solution to a wide variety of parts. Yeah, and yeah. and basically. It allows you to test opens and shorts on the external pins. It's going to tell you if there's uh, not not enough solder connection from uh -huh. one pin to another, or it's going to show you a short between one pin and another pin. It's going to show you those type of things. But again, it's only beneficial, or, it, or it's more beneficial if it's if it remains on the target board and you don't remove it before you actually execute the boundary scan test. Okay. Okay, then then let me ask a question. Okay, right now, okay, if you know normally this part is put on a system, you know the system the system board put, put, probably is pretty big. Okay. I mean, okay, now the customer say, oh, well, okay, this part failed on my system. Yes. I mean, how can I? Well, well, let me let me, be, before you go on, let me ask a question first. Yeah. How did they isolate that that part to be the problem? Uh. Well, I mean, see, okay, on their system. You know, I think that I mean there's a way they, they can figure it out. They can they can uh, they can uh, you know uh, trade they can trace right. They can trace down to the down to which chip doesn't work. 
Although I, I'm asking, I don't know what what type of test they're using because uh, I mean, that ul I don't know either. ultimately, that's that's the function of JTAG is isolating where the failure is. I mean, if you already know where the failure is at, I guess I'm I'm kind of wondering why would you need JTAG? Yeah, because uh, I mean, I mean the the the, the stuff you know the request we got is from. Uh, the vendor, okay. You know, the third-party vendor. Let's say Xilinx. Normally, they they don't sell the parts themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they ask distributors to sell the parts. Right. There, I mean, there's a big big distributor that we know. You know, they they sell parts, all kind of parts. So if somebody so sends you a bad board, I mean, did they send you a re report ticket as to what failed? Well, they just they they just ask us to say, you know say well we have like maybe a uh, fifty parts, you know, fifteen to fifty parts. Those parts fail. Can you guys provide some basic testing on those parts? Tell us what's going on. Uh huh. You know, that's what we got, and that's why you know I'm trying to, you know, and they don't want to pay a lot of, they don't want to pay a lot of money to to find out what what are, what are caused. Well, here's here's what I'm trying to isolate. Are you are you looking for chip level testing or are you looking for board level interconnectivity um, testing? Well, see, so in my case, I think it's a chip level. So, so chip level is not what JTAG tackles. Uh, yes, so, yeah, I mean, sounds like it, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like, Ryan, what he would need is some sort of a driver and a receiver. So if you created some sort of test board where you had your, um, your um, uh, Xilinx chip and then you had, which would be your, your your driving chip, and then you had a receiving chip on another, and then you can do probably interconnect testing. Is that correct? Absolutely, and we we've done this before with uh, you know scan IO modules, and and that's why the scan plus chip tester was built. Um, we basically supply a secondary device that sits on the pins of whatever device that you're testing, and you know it's it's the second device to complete the opens test. So yeah, we do have we do have solutions if you have a chip that's out of circuit, um, you know, to test that the the boundary scan portion of the device is working. Um, but essentially, you're not testing all of the chip's capabilities. You're only no, testing I the mean, JTAG. No. It's, it's it's difficult because uh, you know that the, you know the vendor. The, 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 you know, once the vendor sell the parts to, and then the pro, the, like say the Zydings parts, then the, another, you know, the end customer, they just program it, right? Right. And then the program it, they have a large pattern. Those patterns, they don't want to release to to me. Mm-hmm. Right, because some the some of them is confidential, you know, so they don't want to release a pattern to me. Then they say, well, I mean, I think they 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 just want the ba the basic information, right? Sure. Uh, most likely, I mean, either. Either says either some, there, there's something wrong with the interconnect. Then there's a, or then they will, then they know. Okay, all right. I mean, that's simple. I mean, it's just get another part, just replace it, right? Now, do you have a like a bone pile of boards that you you haven't been able to fix? Is that is that what drove this requirement? Uh, well, no. Yeah. See, see the. See, the only thing the only thing I know is you know that the you know the parts that vend, that uh, third party vendor did they just sold to the their customer got a problem so they just want to retest again but you know it's a it's a it's a small quantity it's not a large quantity right it is not like something that is not like a, a production testing basically it's like a fair analysis type of testing I see and uh for me, um, I, you know, I need to find a solution to to test those parts. But okay, I have I have a, a big tester here, but I, I I I don't know how to create a pattern because you know those, no designers will will, promi will will provide me those patterns to test the device. Right. I need to find out a way to test just the basic functionality. You know, like the open shorts and something something got messed up internally. I I just want to find out that. 
Right. Yeah, we would be able to cover the opens and shorts part, but the the internal logic of a device is not doesn't fall in the JTAG realm of testing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that part I know. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so it sounds like Robert, what you need is you need uh, um, JTAG boundary scan testing as one so method open, in your process yeah. of testing, mm -hmm. in your failure analysis method of testing. That, yeah. That's right. That's right. So this is just yeah. it's not your one stop total solution in determining whether or not this chip, you know. It's just <clears> one, one tool in his toolkit. Yeah, it's just a, a, a tool in your in your bag of, of um, tools that you have that are used in your testing process. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, well, I think uh, this presentation uh, uh, taught me a lot. And uh, something that I know is, I mean, uh, to my customer, you know, uh, later on, if I get this kind of request, I would let them know that. So for right now, for your current application, this is this is where I need to, to lock into. Based on your current application need, um, are you looking to, to do something like what Ryan had just demonstrated for your current application? Or, or is this something that may be um, useful down the line in other applications? Yeah, well, this is something uh, that that is going to be useful for you know I say you know the fair nozzle type uh -huh. okay. uh, to my to the normal testing you know uh, that that I'm doing is not okay so right I, okay yeah. I, I am a testing engineer so I just I get I get us to, all those test vectors and generate a test program on a tester uh -huh. to to do the testing uh, but you know now we got small orders we we just reject them you know because. Because well, they ask us, well, can I test the part? We say, well, I mean, look, I don't have pattern up nothing, but you know, before I don't know, before before I don't know this JTAG, but now I know, I, I can tell them, I can offer them a solution and say, well, we I we can help you to test the basic functionality. I mean, the the basic open source basically, you know, we we can access your your JTAG port and uh, find out. If well, essentially, a, you could probably start your testing process. You can lead in with JTAG boundary scan testing up front. To uh, check for opens and shorts, and then if uh, you don't find any uh, faults on your pens, then at that point you can you can dig in deeper. So this would be essentially the first phase in your testing process uh -huh. yeah. that would probably save you a tremendous amount of time on yeah. the front end. Yeah, I mean, okay, which see, you know, time yeah. is equated to money. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, see, all other products uh, like a test program, you know, I uh, that I'm going to create the, the the customer they they're going to gave us the pattern. Uh -huh. Every device on test, they have they have this boundary scan test pattern for me. They, they, gave, they, they provide those test pattern. Now that's for the uh, entire board? Yeah, entire board, yeah, the entire, the entire chip testing. Okay, so these are JTAG boundary scan compliant yes, yeah, boards. They, yeah. yeah, that's right. The, the, well, the board, yeah, the board also is uh, uh, JTAG, uh, I, I think it's J, JTAG compl uh, compliant, right? Uh -huh. Because there, there's a JTAG access port on the device. And once you build a board, yes, then, then... So these boards are actually sent to you, and then you go through the uh, failure analysis for testing process, correct? Uh, do they, they don't do that in-house? This is something that's not part of their uh, process, your customers? Well, that, well, then, okay, that part, I'm not clear, okay? Because, uh, you know, when they when they figure it out, when they guess, or, or whatever, when they figure out, or when they, when they guess, it could be possible that that's a FEJ part fail, a lattice or a xilinx, then they would just take it out. They said, well, this part doesn't work. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think they have a... Typically, what kind of boards are, are these? Are they... uh, that, that one, I, I have no idea. Uh -huh. You know, we, we, we got... We got I mean, are these commercial board. boards? Um, uh, it's, okay, some of them commercial, you know. Uh -huh. I think, yeah. Like um, single board computers? Are they used uh, analog boards or are they... Um, motherboards and computers, or uh, well, most of them is not is not uh, is pretty specialized. Specialized boards. Yeah, because FPGA, you know, since they you know it's large quantity, right? So uh -huh. you know they just basic type stuff, right? Okay. So it's a specialized board. Okay, and then and then these boards it's are shipped board. to you, correct? Oh, well, those boards they 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 don't ship the boards to us. They they just they they just want to provide a units to us. Uh -huh. Yeah. What do you mean by the unit? You mean just a chip? Uh, they, yeah, they just a chip. Yeah, they just they just take out a chip. So 
So they depopulate, they pull the chip off the board? Yeah, that's right, yeah. And then they just send you the chip? That's right, yeah. Now, are you like a repair house for Xilinx? Uh, or? No, it's not a repair house. It's just we are the testing house of the ISP lab. For, for Xilinx? For, no, not for Xilinx. It's for, for, for everybody. For, okay. okay for, for all those uh, semiconductor companies. Okay. The, all the semiconductor test companies, they have, uh, they, they have the chips, right? They, you know, they, they design the chips, right? They design mm -hmm. all kinds of chips, memory chips or whatever chips. Okay. Now are they are you getting the chips directly from the customer? Or are you getting them from from their suppliers like distribution? Well, this one, this one that you, I'm trying to I'm trying to work on this one is uh, is actually from the from the from the vendor. Not 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 from the manufacturing. Okay, not from the manufacturer. So yeah. from the the uh, distributor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, like um, I know New Horizons is a big distributor for of Xilinx chips. That's right. Yeah. The um, I think that see like for example Xilinx, they have their own manufacturing, right? Right. And then they have they have a, their own testing house uh -huh. to test those parts. But uh, for us, you know, we test for other companies. Right? Let's say uh, you know all those fabulous company, uh -huh. right? They design a chip, then they need somebody to write a program to test their chip. So then the designers will provide all those patterns, the simulation patterns. Then uh, for me, you know. Okay, we just convert all those patterns to, you know, to the tester, you know, format, mm -hmm. and just test those uh, chips. So you essentially have IC testers mainly. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that, you're right. I did all, and all those uh, uh, IC testers I mentioned to you already, like a Vergy, you know, uh, Creden, Paradigm. And, and again, I mean, before you get to to testing these chips. Um, with your IC testers um, if you're looking at essentially